Hi. Hello. That was a lovely introduction. Thank you. And, and, and I'm very informed as well. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I just taught you something about no, yourself. This is good. And, and, and I'm right about all that. Like there was the plan you were going to go into space. And... Yes. It was actually, I mean, as a musician, the whole thing was very inspirational because I learned as I was, because training actually sort of went on for quite a through, few years. I was going through NASA and then I was going to Russia and having all sorts of tests. So you learned a huge amount and it actually sort of helped me musically do the last album, which was called Dream Chaser, and then inspired me for all sorts of visuals for it, for the tour. So I had an, a ball with that, but then went into the training. And uh, unfortunately, I've, I've signed all sorts of NDAs, so I can't really sort of say too much. Mm -hmm. But what, uh, when I did come out of it, it, it was... I saw everything from a, a different perspective. I was so challenged and I was doing brilliantly. I was passing all my exams. So I, I learned a huge amount about myself, but also really about how delicate we all are, how mm. delicate our, our, our planet is, morality, all of those sort of things, which of course we all think about, but because we're in it, we don't really feel these things. And we're... This place is really special. There's nowhere like it. People can talk about Mars. They can talk about the moon. They can talk about all these places, right. but we'll never find anywhere like this. No, it's maybe precious. not. I mean, I haven't tried, but who yeah. knows? You know, I'm, I'm like <laughs> yourself. I haven't, I haven't gone looking for it too yes. much. So at the end of that, though, I must have imagined you were feeling exhausted or I emotional was or something. Very emotionally exhausted to have to come up, but it was a decision I made with my family, and uh, I. I did the things that people do sometimes when they're they're feeling strange. I needed to get back to myself, back to Sarah Brightman, the singer, not the cosmonaut and anymore. And I found a little um, house on the beach, which I rented. And uh, a friend of mine who's an opera coach, he came, I uh, asked him if he'd come and just work with me on my voice. And we just sang for a few months. And then out of all of that really came this album because I wanted to do songs which were very choir based. Choirs mm. would fit well with. I, I wanted to sing with lots of human beings mm. and songs that were kind of quite uplifting. So I tell you, I'm so tired of the same old music industry story all the time. <laughs> Sold a billion records, tried to be a cosmonaut, and then made another album. I mean, if I get another <laughs> guest in like this, I don't know what I'm going to do. I want to play a little music uh, that's related to this new album. It's not from the new album, but it's related to it, and okay. I think you'll understand why. Take Thank a listen. That is deep in the mountain. So high. If you want to see God, you've got to move on the other side. So that's Barclay James Harvest. Of course. And you know, it's a wonderful song, and I always knew it. I mean, it, it wasn't a huge, huge hit around the world, so a lot of people aren't aware, but sublimely a lot of people are aware of it. And I remember it was actually one of the reasons why I got together um, with and, and started working with my, my long-term producer, Frank Peterson, because when we, when we first met in, in the early um, uh, 1990s, he said, look, I'm going to make you a cassette of, and it was cassette those days, of all the songs, uh, all these songs I've got ideas that you should maybe sing um, so that we're on, we know we're on the, on, on the same wavelength. And I was in my little Chrysler LeBaron going up Highway 1. I was living in L.A. at the time, and I was going to Carmel, and I, I decided to put this cassette in, and the first one that came up was this song. Right. And I just thought, oh, that's such a great song. However, I wasn't in that headspace to sing something like that at, Why not? at that time. It wasn't, it wasn't what I was, was doing at the time. What were you doing? What was I doing? What was I doing? I did an album called Fly, which was very kind of electronic. Right. And it kind of didn't fit with it. So, but from fly to time to say goodbye was a big, big difference. Right. So let's let's take let's take a listen to your version of the song we just played. So that is Sarah Brightman's version of the Barclay James Harvest song, Him, the title track to her new record. I'm Tom Power. I'm here live in our studio with Sarah Brightman right now. Um, so when you take a song that's well known mm -hmm. in a different genre, what you often do, you take songs that are, are, are big hits in rock or big hits in disco, even though I know I used to play disco as well, and you kind of bring them into your own sort of sphere of music. Yes. Uh, what, what, how do you do that? How do you decide which ones you're going to do? Well, first of all, you have to have the feeling for it. 
the passion for the piece and you have to then decide if you're right to sing it. If you can bring something to it which which gives it something different but still doesn't take away the thread and the root of what the song is. And I'm very particular about that, even with classical pieces that I do. Even if I blend classical pieces together, I never lose the root of it. Yeah. It's important. Um, so that particular piece I just found, we battled a little bit with it because it doesn't really... For, for my kind of voice, it doesn't reach a high note or a low note. I've, I've got a big space in my voice like that. Um, so it, it took a while, and then I just relaxed into it and sang it for what it was, and that's when it started mm. to really work. Of course, putting the, uh, putting the choirs on was great. We did a lot of it at uh, Abbey Road in, in London, oh, so that cool, was huh? fun. Yeah. Yes, yes. Hey, do you do this vocal warm-up? Do you do this one, the... Yes. <laughs> That's the one you do? Yes. What else do you do? What, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in, you don't have to do them, but what, I'm, I do a lot of, I'm trying to figure I, out my vocal warm-ups. Right. Um, this actually, the one you've just done, it's actually done to, to let the tongue relax. The tongue is the worst offender in voices. <laughs> yes. That one? Do you feel the tongue go up at the back? I guess a little bit, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All because right. it's, meant to, it's meant to feel as if it's, it's relaxed and comes forward slightly, as if it's got some air underneath it. Because what happens and why singers get into trouble is the tongue pulls backwards. Oh, yeah. and then And then it starts to cause, then the... the it's air isn't going through into your brain, but it doesn't allow the air to to pass easily onto the vocal cords. So people get into trouble and they start singing from their throat that way. When I was a kid, we used to do red leather, yellow leather. Oh yes, I can't do it this morning. We used to do red leather, yellow leather, red, <laughs> red leather, yellow leather. leather, yellow leather. Yeah, well, there were was... so many. Yes, yeah, man, so lots well, of those brings the tongue forward. The reason the reason I bring up these vocal warmers a because I'm I just, I just want to get free voice lessons from you on the radio, which is essentially what I'm doing. But I want to play another clip from the album. Take a listen. I wanna fly. So that is Sarah Brightman with Fly to Paradise featuring the Eric Whitaker singer. So the reason I bring up my vocal warm-ups is because back when I sang in choirs when I was in high school and I sang in a choir at university, we used to do a lot of pieces by this very famous, uh, very dense composer. Oh, sorry, he himself is not dense, but the music he records, very a lot of different notes, very, very close together, very, very dense uh, chord uh, structures by Eric Whitaker. Tell me a little bit about working with him on this. I mean, he has an amazing way of, 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 of arranging, a very particular way. It's particular to him. And all the new choirs everywhere, they're just loving him. He is the maestro of, of choirs at the moment and arrangements. He, I've, I've been talking to Eric for quite a few years because I was interested in him working on my Dream Chaser uh, album, which I had out. Um, and we, we didn't come forward with anything. And then suddenly um, I heard this uh, beautiful song, which originally I think he wrote for a musical. Um, and it wasn't really well known musical. And I just, I heard it and, and listened to the lyrics. I thought this actually would be perfect for this album. And we met in Los Angeles at my little place there and yeah. had a chat. And he said, yep, I'd be really, really happy. And we said to him, would you mind if we added to it because it it really in a way for this it needs a little a bit of more of a a verse chorus chorus verse um and he said yes i'm fine with it so we experimented for ages until we got it to where it is so i love this piece it's actually one of my favorites on the album sarah brightman here's what um here's what i'm trying to figure out here so the piece we just heard sounds like an evanescent song it sounds like a rock song yes. um there there's as you said you know you i think you're best known for singing opera or singing more classically based mm -hmm. music uh show tunes and stuff like that but there's also a electronic music. I want to play something from this. So this is a, a really, I would say something kind of unexpected. Tens of thousands of kids at an electronic dance music festival called the World Club Dome. So you're at there at a electronic dance music festival. Is that really where I would expect to see you? Well, you know, it is part of my world. I've I've often had uh, 
uh, hits in the in the dance charts. And when I was doing all my bel canto training in Italy from for my classical singing, at weekends I was sort of recording because Frank's a, a German producer, and we'd be in all the clubs in the early nineties. Our friends were DJs at that time. And that's of course where all the dance music came. So it's kind of part of my life. And uh, I wanted to do this uh, that uh, uh, particular this particular song. Um, which of course is Sky and Sand. It was a huge dance hit um, in the on the continent. I don't know if it was a if, if it was a hit here. I don't know if it made it over here. Yeah, no, it might not. not have done. Yeah. It's very familiar on the continent, and uh, it was fun recording it. It was challenging, I have to say, but but it's. Everybody's enjoying it, and I go to these wonderful festivals and go and sing it, and everyone's going, "Hey!" A lot of black backlight. You have to worry about, uh, think about your, because technically the lighting is so amazing at these at these things that I always have to worry that my 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 dress isn't too see through. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what happened on that particular one. Oh really? <laughs> yes. Oh, so that's an ideal. Hey, yes, you don't want that. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I really feel like you don't see genre at all. Hey. I don't. I just love music. You know, like all of us, you hear everybody. It's just my passion. And I'm an interpreter rather than a writer. Right. But I really, I suppose, although I've been very involved in classical, I'm, I'm very much part because it was like the beginning of the era of me enjoying music part of the sort of like progressive rock era which is kind of what my original passion was I mean my first album when I was 12 or 13 that I bought was Emerson Lake and Palmer so I love because I love artwork I love the idea of what's behind things and I love the fusion you know you think of Queen I went to see the Queen movie mm -hmm. and you're just reminded of in that in that era how people really early on fused everything together and mm -hmm. had the freedom to do it and that's how I feel about music now when I'm doing it yeah you really I mean you're right it's, it, genres are something we make up about it yes it's, well I think people are trying to guide guide the general public into into so they know where to go to get particular things but unfortunately sometimes that creates a few barriers for us as musicians so I just go where I want and if they like it they like it I want to I want to close things off this way you have this new album out uh, you've played two Olympics you're one of the best-selling singers of all time you led the Broadway with Phantom of the Opera you sold millions of records um, this is a bit of a hard question but when all is said and done what do you think you'll look back on as like a moment like a moment you remember that you'll that you'll take with you forever um, Probably standing on top of that globe at the Chinese Olympics. It was amazing. It only because I'd, I'd been chosen as the only Western artist to come and represent us for that particular thing in the Olympics. And, and standing on the top of there and singing part of it in Mandarin and being with one of their most famous singing stars. It was just, it was just a very, I just felt, oh, I've come to a pinnacle somehow. It was a right. beautiful thing. It's so nice to meet you. They're really nice to meet you. And it was a lovely interview.